we go. All right, hi everybody. Um, so we're almost an hour late, so I'm gonna kind of re redo this talk on the fly and try to use like 10 minutes and hopefully tell you stuff that's uh, interesting and, and perhaps useful in what you're doing. So I kind of prepared uh, two different chunks of the deck. One is sort of a, an introduction to some of the innards of deep learning, and I'll go through that really quickly. And then I'm going to talk a lot about the work that we're doing in the retina and particular lessons that we've learned in doing this. So there's a, there's a saying that, you know, in theory there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. So we learned a lot by actually doing this, and I'll, I'll share some of those harder lessons so you can make different mistakes than the mistakes we made. So. Um, so just real quickly on deep learning, you know, com comparing, uh, you know, sort of traditional deep learning, uh, traditional machine learning has been around for a long time. And one of the big challenges, the essential way it worked was if you have a bunch of data, this is supervised learning, you would come up with a bunch of features that describe it and think of those features as like a vector. And then you might have a label, these are fraudulent transactions, and these aren't. Learn a formula on the features to make the prediction. And the challenge, particularly in imaging, was what are the interesting features, right? If you're doing facial recognition, you could look for eyes and nose and mouth, and you know, it, it gets very complicated. And you know, maybe credit card transactions, it's easier. And this was always one of the challenges. And year after year, there'd be new PhD theses about new ways of doing features. And really, you know, kind of jumping ahead through, I mean, try to do features that would distinguish those. Um, and so, so, you know, deep learning came, and it, you know, I'm not gonna go into some of the details. One of the big powers is that it learns the features itself by the data. So kind of the visualization that you're seeing here is a, a network that was trained, I think, to recognize faces, and that, like the lower levels of the network learned edges, not the way uh, an engineer would draw those edges, but it learned edges just as we believe is happening in the neurons behind the photoreceptors. You have a set of neurons that are set to the, the photoreceptors, and they're, they're finding edges edges and they go in combination and then textures and features and corners all the way up to the real features. So, so this ability to detect features is really critical and I'll talk about this in a second. So let me switch gears to the retina. So, um, so well actually before I do that let me talk about diabetes. So this is the number of people with diabetes in the world. Uh, it's probably an underestimate. The current thinking is that about 10% of the, of the people in the world will get diabetes, especially as diets are improving. And uh, this is a big problem in the developing world. About a third of, a third of diabetics get a condition called uh, diabetic retinopathy, and it's essentially it's a breakdown in the blood vessels in the eye. You know, diabetics have a lot of vascular problems. That's why they have, you, you know, amputations and things like that. And so for the third that get retinopathy, for about a third of them, it's vision threatening. So sort of 10%, a third, a third, it's about a 1% prevalence disease, but it's the fastest growing cause of blindness in the world. And the way it is, um, it's sort of diagnosed uh, by sort of observation. There's, a, there's very, very detailed rating guides that the ophthalmologists argue over. There's orange spots, that sort of dried plasma that leaked from the blood vessel. There's dark spots as hemorrhages. There, there's a bunch of these, these uh, pathologies that can be diagnosed. It's a sort of five-point scale traditionally, and unfortunately it's only symptomatic at the, at the last scale at proliferative. So if you can catch it early, it's, it's much easier to prevent. By the time you get to be proliferative, you you can, you can stop it, but you can't fix the eye. So this is, if you know diabetics are supposed to get screened every year, please send them in to get screening. Um, and you know, in places like India and Thailand and in China, there's just, there's, there's just not nearly enough um, uh, not nearly enough doctors, and it's kind of sad. I give this talk, and I inevitably have people come up to me and say, "My uncle is blind from this." You know that it, it strikes a lot of people. So uh, we did the normal thing. We said, okay, let's apply deep learning. We, we kind of knew that deep learning would work on this. I mean, you could see the features so obviously. If we could pick a cat or a dog, we can find exudates and hemorrhages. And uh, we did it in kind of a googly way. We were able to marshal quite a bit of resources, and we acquired over 100,000 images. We hired over 50 doctors to give us diagnoses on these images. And it worked great. It worked absolutely fantastic, like way better. People have been using traditional machine learning on uh, the retina for many, many years. There's some wonderful Professor Abramowitz uh, at Utah. They've, they've done some great work. And the results of this were absolutely stunning. There were some bookkeeping predictions that we need to do. So, um, so it worked really well, and we, 
we actually um, spent a lot of time to get this published in JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's the journal that's really focused on the practice of medicine. And so we actually had to do a clinical trial. It, it was, we really treated it as a medical thing rather than a technology thing. And everybody knew this would be sort of a big deal. And the results in 2016 were as good, at, basically as good as a panel of ophthalmologists, which is pretty compelling if you can bring a bunch of ophthalmologists in a box to the developing world. It's kind of a big deal. And you know, not just in the developing world. I, I talk to cab drivers all the time about uh, diabetes. I talk to everybody about diabetes now. And you know, to get screened, you usually have to take a day off from work and go to the doctor and make an appointment. Why can't you just get screened at the pharmacy or at, at the store or somewhere else? So the results were spectacular. And so now let me go to some of the problems. So this slide, we actually had t-shirts made up from this slide. So let me explain what it is. The, the columns are the best of the ophthalmologists we hired. And the rows are patient images that were selected, especially because they were challenging. And the color is the diagnosis that we got from that doctor. So you could see the, the patients, the two at the bottom are clearly sick. The, the one at the top, probably, you know, the two or three at the top are probably healthy. But we got this rainbow of diagnoses. And the ones in black, they got actually every single diagnosis. And um, so we, you know, we tracked, the, and these were the best of the doctors. So we tracked the correlation, the, the correlation across graders and even the correlation within the grader. So we gave the same doctor the same image in a different week and it was only you know, two thirds that they would give us the same diagnosis. So this, this is crazy and so it's funny, I put this slide up and rooms full of doctors, they look at me and say, we're humans, what do you expect? And I look, you know, rooms full of engineers like, we must fix this, this is not okay. You know, and the thing is, retinopathy is a slow moving disease. So I showed this to some pathologists and they were like, these are at, the, at MD Anderson, the, one of the best cancer centers in the US. And they were like, we never get 65%. For us, it's more like 30%. And kind of my jaw hit the floor and they were like, well, it's not really that bad because pathology grading is very technical and there are more grades than there are treatments. In terms of treatment concordance, it's, it's closer to 85%. So what that means is one time in six, you're going to be treated differently if a single pathologist looks at your data than if a group of pathologists look at your data. So if you take one thing away from this talk, it is get a second opinion on your pathology. I, I'm not kidding. I mean, I give this talk and I, you know, this is not, you know, a rural hospital problem. This is one of the, um, the lead of one of the top research labs in the country came up to me after this talk and said, you know, my wife's best friend, she had a biopsy, they did a double mastectomy, they, they, they always redo the pathology after they remove tissue from your body, she never had cancer. There's a, you know, we're making a lot of progress in breast cancer because we can identify different subgroups of patients that have very different treatment. So if you're HER2 positive breast cancer, which my mother was, and she got Herceptin, which is the miracle drug, total remission, they think about 10% of women are being mistreated around Herceptin. So they're either getting it and it's not going to help them, or even more tragically, they have HER2 positive breast cancer, the pathologist misread the slide, it took billions of dollars, years of work to, there's a miracle drug on the shelf and she's not getting it because the, the pathologist missed it at the last minute. So please get a second opinion. So, um, so what Google had done, you know, we had gotten lots and lots of images, uh, lots and lots of um, diagnoses. And what we found, typically what we did is we got, um, if, it was if two doctors thought it was healthy, we stopped labeling it. But if anybody thought it was sick, we got seven different diagnoses on it. And so then afterwards, we were able to do a sensitivity analysis. Did we need all of those um, diagnoses? And we, you know, we just had some consensus way. And it turns out that for the training data, we massively overkilled it. At around two, two and a half diagnoses was more than enough. But for the test data, seven wasn't enough. And you know, we never train on the test data. The test data just tells you which of the million model models you can make is the right one to pick. So we actually started um, curating the test set and we, we hired panels of retinal specialists and we, we literally have adjudication panels where it used to be we brought them in a room in Mountain View and they argued over images. Now we have a whole distributed uh, system and in about 18 months we went from we were as good as, as an ophthalmologist to now we are as good as a team of retinal specialists. And the only, we did not change the machine learning. This is inception version four, like the thing that won ImageNet years ago. This is like out of the box machine learning. It was all in the data. 
So another lesson to take away is do not be afraid of dirty training data, but try to exquisitely curate your test set. And um, Haid was describing some of this. this. The test set is absolutely critical. But, do, but don't be afraid of dirty training data. Use it. But you, you, you know, the, really the, the kind of level of accuracy that you need is only going to come from curating the test set. And you know, just as an example, you know, I talked about some of these, you know, the AUC curves. You know, it, I, I would love to set up screening in train stations in India because a lot of people have diabetes and they don't even know it yet. So if we could catch them, the problem is if it's a 1% prevalence disease and we're only 99% accurate, every other case is going to be a false positive. We're going to flood the, the um, you know, the medical system. So, you know, 90% is, 80% is tolerable, 90% is great, like 99% is, it, it has even got issues. So we have to keep making these systems better and better. So, um, so at, you know, we, we kind of knew that we would um, be able to do a diabetic retinopathy. It was a well understood disease. But then we start saying, well, you know, the, the retina is the place in the body where you can very inexpensively visualize both the, neur the vasculature and the neurons. And we said, what other signals might be there? And there's kind of a funny story behind this. We had these images. We didn't have medical records, but we did know male or female. And there was a young woman who had recently graduated who wanted to, you know, do work on this project. She had a different job inside Google. And we said, well, we know male, female. See if you can predict it. And it's not going to work, but it'll be a good exercise for you. And she came back about two or three weeks later and said, yeah, I, I can predict whether someone is male or female from their retina. And there is nothing in the literature that says male and female retinas are different. We're now at about 97% accuracy. So, um, and What's interesting about this one is we haven't been able to explain it. It does not localize to any one part in the image. And we checked all the obvious about size and things like that. We can even cut these images into 64 by 64 boxes and scramble them. And we don't quite get 97%, but we still get, get uh, a, a pretty good accuracy. Uh, it's mostly around the, uh, around the macula and the optic disc, but we still haven't quite figured it out yet. But this is one of those things, you know, it's come up about explainability. And this is an interesting challenge. So in, in the case of diabetic retinopathy, we can explain it. We can show which parts of the image contribute to the prediction. But for something like, like this, we, we really still can't explain it. Um, and so, you know, if empirically it works, it's, it's tempting. But if you can't explain it, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. So this is the explainability is a big deal. So what about how old you, can t you are? Well, we can tell within about 3.26 years uh, whether you're a smoker or not, not quite as effective. And we actually have a, a, a nature paper out where we can essentially tell your blood pressure, we can tell your H1C level, we can, we can tell all sorts of things. And we're, what we're looking for now is can we tell neurodegenerative disease? Can we tell whether you're anemic or not? As well as glaucoma and AMD. So, you know, one of my hopes is that, you know, right now you go to the doctor and they take your blood pressure and they weigh you and they take your temperature, that they'll just take a, a retinal picture and you'll get a whole health assessment. We can actually predict your risk of having a significant cardiovascular event as effectively as the Framingham score, which is essentially the, the, the point system that they use to treat heart disease now. So it's, it's pretty exciting. And you know, this is published in uh, Nature, so all this stuff is available. And um, uh, so I just want to show you just some example images. I mean, I've been showing you pretty images. But they, these are what, you know, this one doesn't look too bad. And you know, this one you can see, there's sort of a consistency to them. But you know the actual images, or is this showing the actual images that we get start getting you know looking weirder and weirder and weirder. And this is where, but you have to deal with this in the clinical context. Like we want to be screening, and sometimes this is what the images look like. You know, and they get weirder and weirder still. So you know, to to, to get sort of you know very very accurate images, you have to work under a lot of these conditions. The other thing that um, is is actually a big and sort of open area is how confident are you of your actual prediction? Because it's not enough to just say, okay, we, you know, we, think, you, you know, we think you have diabetes or not, but, but how confident is that prediction? Because you might want to act differently. And that's a whole other science again about, and, and there's all sorts of interesting ideas about like dividing your data up into 50 different sections, building 50 different models, and then trying to understand the variance across all the models. And the high variance predictions are the ones that you're going to be less confident over, whereas the low variance ones you will be, because however you build the model, you make it. So uh, it's a really exciting area. I'm glad to sort of answer questions or anything. Sorry it was so rushed, but uh, thank you very much.
we doing Q&A? Yeah. 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 So uh, we, we work very closely with DeepMind. So uh, there's an interesting story about this. So DeepMind was mostly focusing on OCT, which gives you sort of a 3D picture of the retina. And we're, we actually have a European regulatory approval, and we're screening now live in India and Thailand. And one of the things that we discovered is one of the Thai clinics also had OCT. And there's a pathology that comes along with uh, diabetic retinopathy called diabetic macular edema. It's the swelling of the macula, which is sort of the center of your vision. And doctors thought that they could diagnose DME from just looking at the fundus image. And we finally got paired training data from the OCT, the 3D depth, we could tell whether you have macular edema. Edema means swelling. So we got ground truth. And it turns out that doctors are terrible at, at diagnosing DME. They massively overdiagnose it. So we're able to train models that can, can do DME extremely accurately. And what we're able to do um, using GANs, actually, was to be able to build networks that could basically add or subtract DME from any one patient's image. And we're able to update, we have a paper coming out on this, update the grading rubric that says, well, if you look at this set of images, give it a two, and this set, give it a three. So the, the, the combination of this is, you know, the ability to use expensive imaging to then make predictions off of cheaper imaging is very exciting because, you know, lung cancer is going to be a gigantic problem, especially in the developing world, is, you know, the rate of people dying of communicable diseases is going way down, and then the, the, they're dying of the same things that people die in Western countries of cancer and heart disease. And um, lung cancer, we still don't have good treatments for. The trick to lung cancer is to catch it early. And there's some great studies and great work. We have gr great stuff published on this. If you can detect lung cancer early and cut it out, you have a good chance. So, so can we link CTs and, you know, can we make predictions from CTs and then link CTs and x-rays? So it's, it's a very exciting area. But um, Google recently pulled all the health groups together um, under one umbrella, so you'll see a much more consistent messaging. There used to be about five of us doing this research, and now, now we're all working together. So. Yeah, you know, we, we, we are, we're very open about sharing some of the stuff. The data that we got all, often has uh, strings attached to it. So we would actually love to produce a data set like this and share it. And um, we, we've, we've shared data sets in a lot of other areas, and we've benefited from data sets that other people have shared. So we're not quite there yet on the retinal images. but. Um, as we're doing more and more of these screening programs, the governments in, in, in different areas are actually quite interested in doing that, stuff like the UK Biobank, which is just a, if you're interested in medical imaging, I really encourage you to look at the UK Biobank. It's an absolutely tremendous resource. And there's another one coming online in, uh, um, in Southeast Asia, and there's a one that the NIH has. So we would love to do this, but the, the regulatory environment is, is quite... Uh, uh, difficult, but if you go to g.co slash brain slash healthcare, you'll see all of our research papers on this. So, uh, so the, the the question is, how many images did we use, and how much computation did it take? So. We were, we were actually very lucky in that we found uh, a source of lots and lots of images. So in this case, we used 130,000 images, which is an unrealistic number for most medical uh, applications. And again, we, it, it was early in deep learning, and so we were very aggressive about throwing a lot of data. We're getting very, very good results on, on orders of magnitude less data now. We did use lots of computation because we want to try everything. And it turned out that just using inception um, and a little bit of hyperparameter optimization, it, you know, the crazy networks weren't really any better. So we figured we would just ride along with the existing networks. But yeah, I have to say that computational power is quite useful in doing this because we don't really know how to optimize these networks. People can think around and say, well, I think this is better, I think this is better. And the ability to just try it, everything 
is, is, is absolutely fantastic. And like you can sort of rationalize it after the fact that this worked, but being able to try everything and especially trying different sorts of cross-validation. One of the things that we run into all the time is that you lock in on confounding effects. So for example, we had a bunch of um, MRIs uh, and we said, well, just as a, as a test, let's see if we can predict gender. And it was, you know, 0 0.9999. And so it's like, oh, you know, men and women's brains are different. So someone had the obvious thought of saying, what if we cut the brain out of the image and just learn on the brain and then just learn on the image with the brain cut out? And the image with the brain cut out was still 0.999 accuracy because it was looking at facial features and things like that and not at the brain. And with you just did it on the brain section, it was more like 0.85. And the, the point of this is you just have to be really careful about finding confounding factors. So we work a lot in microscopy data, and we can always tell the batch the data came from. We can tell the lab it came from. We could, if there's two different operators doing the experiments, we could usually tell the operator. So for practitioners, one thing I recommend is try to predict everything that you know. And if you could predict something that shouldn't matter, like the batch or the phase of the moon or whatever, you know, maybe you've got signal, maybe you're fooling yourself that you're not really seeing what you think you're doing. It's very easy to treat these systems as magic. Uh, there's another great example of this where um, we had this thing that was called Deep Dream. You can Google it where you could say, okay, I think that looks like a dog. Let me change the image to look more dog-like. And there was a whole set of articles about like, these are what machine learning is dreaming of. And one really interesting thing is when it, it thought it saw a barbell and started materializing the barbells, the barbells had arms attached to them. And it was crazy. It was really freaky to look at it because, you know, we trained it on barbells and barbells often had arms attached. So it's very easy to anthropomorphize what these systems are doing. And they're like, oh, they're seeing what I'm seeing. And it's like, no, they're not. They're seeing pixels. And if the pixels have arms attached, they have arms attached. So it isn't like, oh, this is metal and this is flesh and you have some higher object representation. So you have to be r extremely careful about looking at these uh, strange confounders. And that's where the, the, the computing power comes in to just keep trying things and trying things. But, you know, there's a new generation of hardware coming out, both from NVIDIA and Google and Amazon will make it available. There their CPUs and GPUs are faster yet. There's a new generation of computing uh, power. They, we call them TPUs, tensor processing units. And again, they're not magic. It turns out that if you're just doing training and walking the gradient, you can do much lower precision arithmetic. So you can do 16-bit floats. So if you're doing lower precision arithmetic, because again, you're just walking up or down, you're making it bigger or smaller, uh, you can do incredible amounts of processing. So the hardware that's coming online and every phone is going to have an imputation trip chip the same way. So there's this whole hardware revolution going on behind the scenes to back this. One of the exciting things about deep learning is that it might take an acre of computers to train a model, but you can impute it. The model itself is very small and you can run it on a small device, which is great for phones. It's great for medical devices. It's great for security too. There's a big push now. You know, my mother is old and I would love to have something in her house that would alert me if she's in trouble, but she's not going to put a camera and a microphone streaming to the to the web in her living room, but if we could put the models on the device so that the device could recognize it and then just you know send out the alert. So you're going to see a big push towards remote learning models because it's, it's just more, more secure and more privacy protecting. So again, we're in the middle of a revolution here. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. There's a fantastic research team here. Yeah. Oh, please get in touch with them. There's amazing people here. They're doing tremendous research. There was one other question over there. Uh, excuse me. Uh, oh, g.co slash brain slash healthcare. And another one to go to is g.co slash research slash GAS, gas. And that's, that's actually my team. And we do a lot of we do a lot of energy and climate and um, low-level science, protein evolution, computational chemistry, um, all, you know, uh, uh, simulation. Uh, machine learning and simulation are really interesting couples because we're learning that we can train models 
to predict the results of very expensive simulations. So you run the expensive simulation, you train a model, and then the model can, you know, we can calculate DFT calculations, quantum properties of molecules, we can run PDEs, so like two-thirds of the world's supercomputing budget. It turns out that there's, there's repeating patterns in that data that machines can learn. So we're in the middle of a revolution, so thank you, thank you.